Ah, the Nintendo GameCube. The little lunchbox that couldn't. I have so many fond memories playing that console as a kid. I spent countless hours playing through all those great Nintendo games, hanging out with friends playing Melee, and going through game stores looking at all the games I couldn't afford. I was perfectly content with the GameCube being my main console of that generation, but it didn't take me long to see the problems. As I got more obsessed with gaming, I started to follow what was going on in the industry, and much to my dismay, I started to realize Nintendo wasn't doing very well. As it turned out, the GameCube ended up becoming one of Nintendo's worst selling consoles, and I couldn't understand why. How could that be? The GameCube was awesome. What did people not like about it? There have been many theories speculating about this, but from what I saw, the biggest problem with the GameCube was that it wasn't edgy enough. Just look at the other consoles. They're all covered with grills and have sharp corners all over the place. And then look at the GameCube. Well, it's a cube. Only 12 edges? What nonsense is this? Wait a minute. The vertical sides are shorter than the horizontal sides. This isn't a cube. It's a prism. It's a prism. But seriously, Nintendo had a massive image problem when it came out. This was the early 2000s where everything needed to be dark and have an attitude. Majority of titles like Halo, Grand Theft Auto, and Devil May Cry dominated the gaming landscape. And they all skipped the GameCube for one reason or another. The GameCube would get a few mature titles here and there, even some made by Nintendo, but they would always seem to get pushed to the wayside in favor of more family-friendly titles. This gave the impression that the GameCube was more of a kid's console, and nobody would be caught dead playing kid's games during the edgy 2000s. Sure, Nintendo always had a family-friendly slant to them, but they also catered to older gamers as well. Take the Nintendo 64, for instance. Early in the system's life, Nintendo would release GoldenEye 007. Despite being a late movie tie-in, it would become the premier console shooter of that generation, solidifying the Nintendo 64 as the mainstay of college dorm rooms everywhere. Many developers looked at GoldenEye's success, and they would release their own assortment of shooters and other mature titles for the console. The Nintendo 64 might not have been as successful as the PlayStation, but in America, it managed to create its own niche that allowed Western third parties to continue supporting the system. Elsewhere, though, was a different story. To Nintendo's dismay, first-person shooters wouldn't take off in Japan, as they would rather play long RPGs and fighting games using the power of CDs. Because of this, Nintendo came dead last in the console race, and because they didn't want to get their asses kicked on their home turf, they were determined to make a console that was more appealing to Japanese audiences. They were looking to make something that stood out from the competition. Generally, Japanese living spaces are considerably smaller compared to the West. And with modern consoles becoming these massive behemoths of machines, Nintendo thought it would be a good idea to make their system as compact as possible. It was quite the engineering feat at the time, as they were able to make a system that was comparable in power to the competition at a fraction of the size. Too bad they had to ruin it by making the system purple. Yes, multiple colors were popular with other Nintendo products, but did they really need to make their main color for their system purple? In the West, purple was the color of lame dinosaurs. Who won a console with that color? Nintendo did realize this by also offering a black variant at launch, but they were adamant on making the main marketing color of their console purple, which made the GameCube look like a toy. This was especially problematic as other game consoles were becoming less toy-like. Starting in the 90s, console manufacturers pushed multimedia functionalities to make their consoles more appealing than non-gamers, and the new trend in the 2000s was to add DVD support. It might sound antiquated nowadays, but DVDs were a huge deal in the early 2000s. People wanted the improved video quality, and not needing to rewind tapes anymore. The only problem was, standalone DVD players were expensive, but if you bought a game console, you could get a DVD player for cheap, while also being able to play games. This added a ton of value to consoles, but Nintendo didn't care because they were too paranoid about piracy. They knew they needed to switch to some disc-based format since the small and expensive cartridges were becoming too much of a hindrance, but they didn't want to pay the DVD fees, and of course, deal with ripped discs. As a compromise, Nintendo created their own custom mini-disc format for games, while making the disc drive too small to hold regular discs. But there was one problem. The smaller discs still couldn't hold enough data, especially as developers were working with DVDs on other consoles. They could use multiple discs if they wanted bigger games, but it cost too much since they had to buy discs directly from Nintendo. Because of this, many third parties decided the GameCube wasn't a good fit for their games, and skipped it entirely. Some would say this problem was overblown, as most games of that gen didn't need all the DVD space and could be tweaked to fit on a GameCube disc. This might be true, but another reason why many devs skipped out on the console was because Nintendo wasn't bringing in the desired audience for their games, meaning they were focusing heavily on family-friendly titles. And boy did they go hard appealing to kids. Even when comparing Nintendo's titles to kids' titles on other platforms, 
A lot of these games felt like Nick Jr. compared to the other consoles Nickelodeon. Take Super Mario Sunshine, for example. Being the long-awaited sequel to one of the greatest games ever made, many people were excited to see how Nintendo could top it. Instead, we ended up with a game that was focused more on cleaning up gunk than being a solid platformer. There are less levels in 64, there are too many collectibles, the voice acting was cringingly cheesy, and those ads were just dumb. Cherish life and never waste. Everyone loves a sunshiny day. We're gonna keep it that way. With the next Zelda, Everyone was expecting a darker setting after Majora's Mask, and especially after the tech demo they showed at Space World. However, when we ended up getting this cel-shaded game where Link looks like a deformed fetus, everyone was pissed! Even though Wind Waker was well received by critics, a lot of people couldn't get over the cartoonish graphics, and it became the poster child for why the GameCube was seen as kitty. It got so bad that Nintendo conceded and gave those fans the game they actually wanted, only for them to hate that game too! It seemed like many of Nintendo's games ended up disappointing to a lot of people. To many, it felt like Nintendo had lost their touch, but at least they would have Rare to carry them through. Oh wait! For some reason, Nintendo decided to let Rare go. After refusing to purchase the Stanford Brothers stake of the developer, Microsoft rushed in and bought them instead. It was a shock to everyone seeing how much they helped in bringing out games for the Nintendo 64 during its dry periods. In Nintendo's defense, many of Rare's Golden Age developers had already left by that point, but it was still a huge blow of their portfolio, even if their last game was. Oh dear God! Speaking of Microsoft, they were entering the console market with the Xbox, and they needed all the help they could get. A lot of people were skeptical at first, but people soon warmed up to it once they saw all the cool features it had. It was more powerful than the GameCube, had an incredible online system for the time, and it could even play DVDs once you bought a remote. It also had a great library of games, but the one game that stood out from the others was the killer app, Halo. Much like Goldeneye was for the Nintendo 64, Halo revolutionized the way we played shooters on consoles, making the Xbox a new, cool system for shooters of that generation. Even if the Xbox didn't do that much better compared to the GameCube, third parties still supported it due to the more mature audience. And then you get to the real competition. This would be the real reason why the GameCube failed, and its name is the PS2. My god was this thing a beast when it came out. Sony used the momentum they had with the PS1 to dominate everyone before the competition even arrived. Hell, the PS2 was able to kill the Dreamcast on hype alone. Within its first year in the market, it had already obtained some of the greatest games of all time, and Nintendo would never be able to catch up by that point. Even with a decent library of games at launch, many people were still disappointed with what the GameCube offered. People wanted a DVD player. People wanted to play mature rated titles with serious stories and tons of killing and all Nintendo had was a purple lunchbox. It also didn't help that the advertising was god-awful. Seriously, I know avant-garde was the style of the time, but these ads made no sense. They were just random cubes floating in space. Take this ad for Luigi's Mansion. We see this hot goth chick seducing this guy, but oh no, she turns out to be a spooky ghost. Only to cut to Luigi in his pants. Who thought this was a good idea? Because of all this, the GameCube struggled to sell throughout the generation. Nintendo would try their best to make the system more enticing. They would change the main color of their system to silver, they would get a better advertising slogan, even if some of these ads were still weird, and they dropped the price of the console to a meager $100 of the game included. But it still wasn't enough to get past its bad reputation. And it's such a shame too, because the GameCube truly was awesome. I should know! I was there from the beginning! It might not have all the cool features or have as many games as the other systems, but there was a lot to the system that you couldn't get anywhere else. Plus, with the console being $100 for most of its life, it made sense to get one, even as a complimentary system for the other consoles. But alas, because the GameCube didn't have many of the edgy mature titles back then, most people didn't give the console another look. But eventually, the edgy era of the 2000s would pass, and kiddie titles would be seen as acceptable again. Many people took another look at the GameCube and saw that, indeed, it did have a ton of incredible titles. But since it didn't do well, we're all paying the price for it. Seriously, have you seen how much GameCube games cost these days? Even from the console itself, there was a lot to love about it. From its great startup screen, the convenient handle that allowed me to take the console places instead of talking to people, and that incredible controller. Holy shit do I love this thing. Many people made fun of the bean-shaped buttons, but I find them ingenious. I always find myself losing track of where my thumb is and accidentally pressing the wrong button. But with different sized buttons, I don't have that issue. I keep my thumb on the big A button and move my thumb around as needed. I can easily tell which button I'm pressing without needing to constantly adjust. 
Plus, the controller fits perfectly in your hands, where I could keep playing for hours without my hands getting tired. Yes, the controller isn't perfect, the Z button is hard to press, the D-pad is a little too small, and the tiny C-stick can make it cumbersome to use for camera control. But with a little tweaking, I feel like it would be the perfect controller. But unfortunately, we're stuck with these cross buttons till the end of time. And of course, you can't mention the GameCube without talking about the games. A lot of people would say many of Nintendo's games during this era were disappointing, but the GameCube was the first Nintendo console I ever owned. And from my past experiences, those games did me just fine. Hell, a lot of GameCube games are considered to be some of the best games in their respective franchises, like Metroid Prime, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, F-Zero GX, and the one game that people play instead of bathing for the past 20 years, Super Smash Bros. Melee. It wasn't just the standard franchises that got the love either. Nintendo was experimenting with a ton of new IPs at the time. Now that 3D design had matured, there's no need to test the concepts of time and space, so titles had the freedom to get more experimental. What if we had a real-time strategy game where you used a whistle to attack enemies and collect items? What if you had a survival horror game where you lost sanity over time? What if we had a game where you controlled a small robot that cleaned up after people? What if you could play Donkey Kong Country with bongos? Or how about a Pac-Man game, but the player used a GBA while console controllers played the ghost? Holy shit, that's amazing! They should make an entire console based on that! No. Definitely no. Positively no. Decidedly no. Uh-uh. A lot of people complained Nintendo games were at least too infrequently for their liking, but that wasn't a huge problem, as there were a ton of third-party games released for the system. Maybe not as many as the other consoles, but there's still a ton of play that my childlike finances could afford. We had LucasArts with Rogue Squadron, Capcom with the Resident Evil titles, Namco with a few RPGs and some Nintendo titles, and surprisingly, we got Sega. After spending decades competing with Nintendo in the console business, Sega went third-party and started making games for everyone. Sega was especially prolific on the GameCube, as they provided a bunch of Dreamcast ports, as well as some well-regarded exclusives like the Super Monkey Ball franchise and Billy Hatcher. The GameCube also became the main home of the Sonic franchise, where many people played those games for the first time there. As the GameCube continued to flop sales-wise, many third parties would pull support for the system, and by 2005, game releases went down to a trickle. It didn't matter how many great exclusives it had, how cheap it was, or even if you could play Game Boy games on the TV. Nobody wanted a GameCube at the time, and I feel the system deserved better. I stuck with the GameCube to the end, and even though I would eventually get an original Xbox to play some of the games I was missing, I still see the GameCube as my favorite console ever. It might not have the largest game library, but it had so many great games I never felt like I made the wrong choice. Nintendo tried their best to compete against everyone else, but it simply wasn't enough. With the death of the GameCube, Nintendo would take the company in a completely different direction. So it felt like the end of the classic Nintendo era, and I guess that's why many people appreciate the GameCube nowadays. It was the last time Nintendo was aiming for the cutting edge, where they experimented with a ton of new ideas, and where Nintendo reached their peak with some of their franchises. Fortunately with time, the GameCube is finally getting the respect it deserves, and I'm glad people can finally appreciate the system for what it is. I just hope Nintendo can try to bring some of that magic back, whether it's by experimenting with new ideas again, or to at least bring more GameCube titles to the Switch. For real, Nintendo, do you really expect us to pay these prices?